we're obviously in the, um, uh, witnessing a, a really extraordinary set of events uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It, it's sometimes very hard to follow what line the United States uh, and NATO is following in deciding to provide some forms of assistance and not other forms of assistance to Ukraine. Do you think we're getting the line right? Well, that's something we're actively debating and I'm actively uh, wrestling with and reflecting on, Michael. One of the challenges uh, as uh, elected officials in the Senate and House uh, make public pronouncements about whether we should or shouldn't um, send MiG-29s, for example, or S-300s or different weapon systems, um, either from the American inventory that we uh, captured at some point uh, during the wars in Southwest Asia or from NATO allies, um, is that I keep urging my colleagues, we should rely on the professionals in our intelligence community uh, and in our military who are advising our president on which weapon systems and which level of engagement will prove to be too escalatory. Um, but as someone who has sat through a number of classified briefings and a fair number of open briefings on the topic, the simple answer is we don't really know. We are coming right up against a Cuban Missile Crisis moment in terms of uh, a direct confrontation between NATO, the United States, the West, and Russia. Vladimir Putin, I don't need to tell you or this audience, um, shocked most of Europe um, by launching the largest military invasion of a neighboring country since the Second World War. Uh, as the Polish ambassador recently told an assembled group of several dozen senators, incredulous in the first days after this war began, uh, this is a 1939 moment. And so as we watch night after night, uh, as our news shares with us uh, graphic details of uh, horrific assaults um, that are killing tens of thousands of civilians, and decimating ancient cities throughout Ukraine, we have to ask ourselves that very question. How far are we willing to go? What is the line we're willing to push? And to hear President Zelensky's plea um, that we need to make sure that freedom is armed better than tyranny. Thank you, Senator. When you're thinking about the situation in Ukraine, uh, some people have trouble understanding why we might not really defend them when we have promised to defend all of, of NATO. So if if there's a, an attack on Ukraine that's, you know, 10 miles from the Polish border, we're going to be kind of careful. But if we see a bomb land in Poland, then are we all in? So what's the, what's the dividing line that we should be thinking about between countries that are in NATO and Ukraine? So in the first um, week of the conflict, uh, and frankly, in the week leading up to the conflict, uh, I had a number of exchanges with Republican colleagues. Uh, one of, I, I won't name him, but a Midwestern Republican colleague who uh, was in the military and is quite a hawk. Um, and he was saying to me that he thought it was a big mistake for President Biden to clearly say that American troops would not be going into Ukraine that we would provide military arms, we would provide intelligence, we would provide um, other financial support, but we would not send troops, we would not fight Americans in Ukraine. And he also said, we will defend every inch of NATO territory. And this colleague of mine was saying, the president made a mistake in preemptively declaring that line, that we, this side of the line, we will, we will defend every inch. That side will provide material, but not troops. And I reminded him that that was a line that needed to be reinforced because of our previous president. I don't want to spend too much time relitigating the international record of President Trump, um, but he put at question whether or not we really would come to the defense of NATO uh, publicly and privately in statements, speeches, and actions. Uh, he significantly undermined the strength of our commitment um, to Article 5 uh, of the NATO treaty, which, which says that we will all come to each other's defense. So I think the question that we have to ask ourselves and that Europeans are asking us is first, will we actually meet that commitment? Will the United States across electoral cycles reliably come to the aid um, of Lithuania or um, of, of a Balkan or a Baltic state if invaded 
uh, by a neighboring country first. And President Biden has repeatedly and forcefully reassured that. Second, um, will we come to the aid of a country like Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine um, that has sought NATO membership, is trying to get into NATO, is trying to align with the West, but is not currently covered by that NATO treaty. And then last, and this is a point President Zelensky of Ukraine has made repeatedly, pointedly, and at least in my case, effectively, um, that really troubles my conscience. In 1994, Ukraine had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Mm -hmm. and they willingly gave it up um, in exchange for a written commitment from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity. So as President, as President Zelensky forcefully said to those of us assembled at the Munich Security Conference, is your word worth anything? Now, President Biden just announced, uh, I think yesterday, uh, another $800 million in uh, materials, uh, including howitzers and uh, drones and armored personnel carriers. We are um, overwhelmingly the largest provider of arms and humanitarian support um, to Ukrainian refugees and to the Ukrainian armed forces and territorial defense uh, forces. Um, but we are still respecting that line. And to the point of your question, Michael, it is somewhat arbitrary. And the fact patterns um, are going to force this question. There almost certainly will be an incident where um, Putin goes too far, either within Ukraine by using chemical weapons or just over the border by claiming an accident in which uh, a cruise missile strikes an arms depot where Americans are unloading Stinger missiles from a C-17 uh, about to go across the border. Mm -hmm. We are in a very dangerous moment where it is important that on a bipartisan and measured way, uh, we in Congress and the administration come to a common position about when we are willing to go the next step uh, and to send not just arms, but troops to the aid and defense of Ukraine. If the answer is never, um, then we are inviting another level of escalation and brutality by Putin. Um, but so far, that is the answer of a majority in Congress and this administration. Thank you, Senator. You mentioned that uh, you had a chance to hear directly from uh, from Zelensky about the events on the ground. Um, and that mode of interaction is, uh, in, in many sense, a new one. The president of another country directly connecting with the legislatures uh, from, from around the world, with the, the public from around the world. Uh, could you comment a little bit about what it's been like to hear um, the president talk that way and uh, whether you think it's an effective strategy um, for him uh, to pursue. President Zelensky um, has redefined himself and uh, his nation in the eyes of the world, certainly in the eyes of the American Congress, uh, with electrifying um, real-time personal direct appeals. Uh, I first met him a number of years ago um, but on Christmas Eve of last year, two dozen of us, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, um, spent more than an hour on a call with him at a point where there was a Russian buildup, um, but far from certainty that there would be an invasion. In fact, the United States was saying, we believe you're a genuine risk. And um, there was some frustration uh, in Congress and the administration that President Zelensky and many other leaders in Ukraine seem more focused on settling scores internally and uh, on other issues than they were on really preparing for this conflict. The next time I had as direct an exposure uh, to him was at the Munich Security Conference where we were in the same room as he delivered a really powerful address. And then it was just a few days later that the war began. Since then, I've been on several calls with him, but the most memorable was he addressed the entire assembled Congress of the United States. Um, several hundred of us uh, gathered in a, a big chamber uh, that's underground that's near the Capitol. Um, to hear a real-time address, and it was powerful, motivating, personal. The forcefulness behind his appeal, frankly, Michael, is rooted in his personal courage. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a young, beautiful family, um, and it's now public what we all first learned in a classified setting, that the United States, when the Russians were encircling Kyiv, uh, and that we had credible intelligence that there were several assassination teams um, hunting for Zelensky and trying to kill him and his family, we offered to remove him, to exfiltrate him, to give him a safe passage outside the country and to launch a government in exile. 
And his memorable response was, I don't need a ride, I need more ammunition. And that sort of personal courage, those daily broadcasts by him and his most senior advisors from the center of Kyiv as there were um, as there were shelling and bombardments and as there were uh, special forces units from Russia in the city. Uh, I think that helped galvanize the world. Um, but frankly, the willingness to fight by the Ukrainian people of all ages and backgrounds genuinely surprised the Russians and has genuinely motivated the world. The United States has long counted itself the world's principal beacon uh, of liberty and promoter of democracy and open societies. Um, Ukraine today is showing us what it looks like to actually fight for those principles at enormous cost and to be unwilling to compromise and to simply give up in the face of overwhelming odds.